Hello, everyone. Come on in, as we say on Wednesday. Hello, welcome. Welcome, welcome. This is the 877th Brooklyn Rail NSC Never Stopping Ever Environment, New Social Environment. I am subbing in for our usual Wednesday host, Anselm Berrigan, uh, who's in uh, Spain, I think, on vacation. My name is Carolyn. I work at the rail with the two people who make the social environment new happen every day, Chloe and Eleanor. Um, every Wednesday, we have some poetry for you. This is the 146th episode of this, and I'm so excited today. We have uh, a play reading, reading play of Kathy Acker's The Birth of a, of a Poet from 1985 thoughtfully curated and put together by Ethan Philbrick. Um, so I'm just gonna read the bios of our wonderful participants today, and then I'll get out of the way here. Sophia Giovaniti is a conceptual artist who studies the total commodification of the parts of ourselves we hold dear, positing from a materialist perspective that there is no way out but through. She is interested in choreographic failure, money, the ongoing distortion of reality through images and language, autonomy, revenge, the disappointments and casualties of modern feminism, narcissism. She attempts to exploit, transgress, and re-choreograph traditional modes of value extraction from artists. Her work has been shown at Recess, the Athens Biennale, Duplex, Pipao, and the ICA London, among others. She is the author of Working Girl on Selling Art and Selling Sex from Verso out this year. We'll have a link to that in the chat. And her work exists largely in the through space of sale, scam, betrayal, and reflection. Elliot Reed is an artist working in performance, sculpture, and video. Their art starts from the body, making a choreographic language through ob objects, installation, and sound. Using an intermediate approach Elliot's projects aim to capture the idiosyncrasies of live performance through physical means. Reed is the founder, director, and sole employee of Elliot Reed Laboratories, a production office located inside the artist's body, which holds a copyright with the Library of Congress and an LA County business license. Reed has performed and exhibited internationally, including at the Studio Museum, Harlem, MoMA, PS1, OCD Chinatown and the Hammer, among several other venues. His text, Manifesto Perf Performance Art Is, was printed in the Drama Review, published by MIT Press. And Ethan Philbrick is a cellist, artist, and writer. His book, Group Works, Art, Politics, and Collective Ambivalence, was published by April of this year by Fordham University Press. There will be a link to that as well, get a copy. Projects include Slow Dances at the Kitchen and Montez Press, Days, Mutual Aid Among Animals at the Armory, Song in an Expanding Field at the Poetry Project, um, The Gay Divorcees and Marches for Marches at Triple Canopy, uh, among many others. Phil Philbrick ho holds a PhD in Performance Studies from NYU. Thank you all so much for being here, for joining, and I'll just turn it over to you, Ethan. Thank you. Um, thank you all for coming. How fun to be here in the digital sphere for our Wednesday lunchtime, or maybe you're in a different time zone. It's a different moment and Wednesday, but um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, thanks for Brooklyn Rail for gathering us, Carolyn for the invitation. And thanks also big, big thanks to two artists I admire so deeply, Sophia and Elliot for agreeing to join in this reading. Um, I'm gonna offer some introductory remarks um, and then we're going to read an excerpt from the first two acts of Kathy Acker's playtext for The Birth of a Poet. And um, then depending on time, we'll have a little conversation afterwards. Um, so to start off for some context, in the fall of 1985, The Birth of a Poet premiered at the Brooklyn Academy of Music Opera House as part of BAM's Next Wave Festival, billed as a landmark operatic collaboration between prominent figures of the New York avant-garde with costumes and sets by David Saul, music by Peter Gordon, direction by Richard Foreman, and the playtext we'll be reading today by Kathy Acker. Um, the piece became infamous 
So here's a, to get some of the sort of like circulation of this piece in, in the weeks around its premiere, I hear are some little excerpts. Um, so here's a portion of BAM's archival account of the performance. I'm just gonna put some links in the chat if you wanna see these full accounts. Um, so here's this, this BAM archival account. Um, part of 1985's Next Wave Festival, the birth of the poet was reviled at its premiere. The audience, those who hadn't already walked out, Barrage the actors with booze, and the next day's reviews unanimously echoed the audience's rage. The birth of the poet is considered one of the most panned shows of the next wave. Certainly, there was a lot to absorb in this prickly, punky, neo dada melting pot or meltdown, depending on who you ask. And then here is a bit from um, John Howell's review in Art Forum that came out, you know, I think in the week of its premiere. This quote opera was the wildest collaboration yet staged in the Brooklyn Academy of Music's quote, pack happy next wave series since the production's principals, director Foreman, librettist Acker, composer Gordon, set and costume designer Sal would admit to no collaboration at all. The birth of the poet gathered together artists who are notorious for their various forms of decadence, but totally failed in any attempt to fuse their collective energies into a meta decadent spectacle. What was intended to be a corrosive blast of our toadian bile turned out to be only an empty Warholian fart of impotent hooey. And then lastly, here's just a little excerpt from the Times Review written by John Rockwell, um, the birth of the poet, which opened in the Brooklyn Academy of Music's Opera House on Tuesday night and continues for seven performances and all through Sunday night as part of the Next Wave Festival is a mess. It is a well-intentioned, neatly crafted mess with often interesting contributions from the individual artists involved, but as a collaboration, it fails decisively and was greeted by those who stuck it out to the end with a positive or negative question mark barrage of booze. Given the half century old nose thumbing surrealist conventions of the staging, however, perhaps the evening's authors considered this anti-triumph a triumph. Um, so today we're here to return to this scene of decisive failure and incoherent meltdown. Um, and in revisiting Kathy Ecker's text on its own, we're pulling apart a collaboration that seems to have been dreamed up by the quote, pack happy bam, new wave festival public relations department. We're decombining a miscombination, pulling apart previously conjoined elements to find new conjunctions inside these parts, resisting the institutional call for the collaborative project to always collaborate, cooperate, to be the good joiner, so as to find the multiple, the assembly inside the supposedly single authored text. So um, we're gonna read the first two acts of the play together um, and play with that reading. I'll be reading stage directions and Elliot and Sophia will be reading a distillation of the script that is an ensemble piece, but we've distilled it into a two-hander. Um, and then as the, so as the last offering before we read, here's something that apparently Richard Foreman said to the cast of the original production during a rehearsal, because we haven't read this together. This is our only performance and rehearsal of it. You know, so, um, but so this is something Richard Foreman said to the to the cast as they were rehearsing and it's documented by performer Stuart Hodes who um, wrote a like account of the rehearsal process. So this is Richard Foreman's words to the cast. We live in a corrupt and corrupting world and you can't say tomorrow you'll change. Never mind your desires for transcendence, you'll never make it. You all know you're stupider, cruder, nastier than you should be and you're not going to change. That's the tragedy and that's what this piece is about. Remember that in art, we're simply trying to confront the impasse. Um, so here we go in confronting the impasse and here's also, um, the script we'll be reading from this last link, this Google Drive link. So if anybody wants to be reading along, if that's helpful. Um, okay. So here we go. Um, this is Birth of the Poet, 1985, Kathy Acker, um, and Act One. 
The stage looks exactly what New York City looks outside the theater, the middle of a huge nuclear power plant, dark and cavernous. This factory is the newest of the new. Yes, we don't even get paid. Everything is provided for us. We do everything for ourselves because we're modern. We even hire limbless spasmodics. The only thing we need to keep going is files. Files the workers' medical insurance, files the workers' life insurance, files of the workers' car insurance, files of the workers' theft insurance, files of the workers' fire insurance. This is the only reason we need workers. Yeah. Products are out of date. No one can afford to buy anyway. What about the bosses? They're on salary like the rest of us. The business pays for everything. We make energy. Coal is obsolete and dirty. Oil almost brought the world to its knees begging for survival. This new energy will drive millions of new machines forever and ever. We are creating it. Nuclear mixed with solar energy allows the possibility of worldly existence. We need solid, capable workers. We need workers who can understand what we're doing. Who will work harder because there's nothing to work for? Production continues uninterrupted. We will never again allow a shortage of energy in the modern world. And what if this place should blow up? What do you want now? We were just betting on the temperature of the air outside. I got a report from the factory. Your machine? Some fission material is missing. Where? During the process. A leak? Probably a computer mistake. Has it happened more than once? I've been watching steadily for five hours now. There's nothing wrong with the computer? I'd better find out. The world's ending, the world's ending. Report from third workshop, production one point below quota. Report from fifth workshop, production two points below quota. Report from fifth computer, fission leakage up three points. Control stations on fourth level register reduced energy production by performance up to 12 behind target. Whose fault is it? All computers work perfectly. All seismographs work perfectly. All cyclotrons work perfectly. All borrowing effects work perfectly. Report from the first workshop, all alarm sounding. Report from the second workshop, all transport buses racing from their sheds. All workers while trying to escape under total discipline and time cards. Steady food supply with generous priorities while collapse of workers at gauge pedal lever. Movement becomes autonomous for survival. Excessive duration of the one action stops the body from digesting. Poison piles up. Power, in its essence, is in no way material. It has no essence at all in a philosophical sense, and it is an apparently unnameable figment of the imagination. I'll bet you the nuclear leakage factors is up 15 points. 20. How much? Ten. Fuck you, look at the weather outside. Nothing's wrong there. What are you doing? I'm calling weather to find out how much nuclear leakage is in the air. The phone lines aren't working. Report from control room. This is the end of the world. There is just rubble and smoke. Out of this rubble rises, act two. And here's the title of act two. I'm thinking about you right now and I've been thinking about you for days. When I jerk off, I see your face and I'm not going to stop writing this because then I'll be away from this directness, this happiness, this isness, which is 
At the same time, I'm never going to have anything to do with you again because you, even if it is just because of circumstances, won't love me. This isn't the situation. I'm being a baby as usual. There are complications, our shades, hues, never either or. The shades or meanings come out, you rotten cocksucker. And so then this act is divided into five parts and it takes place in ancient Rome with two characters, Cynthia and Prop. Paratus talking outside of a building. And so this is the first part to the door. Why aren't you grabbing my cunt every chance you get? I love fucking in public streets. And why are you telling me you want to be friends and work with me more than you care about sex with me, but you don't want for any reasons to cut out the sex? Do you want to own me without owning me? Why don't you take me? I've only got five minutes. Why does it have to last beyond these grabbing actions? Oh, I believe in love, that thing that is impossible to happen. And you're fat and ugly, and I'm more beautiful than you, and I've got more money, and I can earn more in five minutes in this world. You should be taking me out to dinner. Here's a hole in the window we can climb through to where we can fuck. When I was a kid, I used to use a bottle with something in it. Now I've got cunts, but cunts have women attached to them. By Augustus's nose, I'm a man. The best wet dream I had was in high school. I was fucking this girl I desperately wanted to fuck her whole, disappeared. I still kept shoving, rubbing up against her. I woke up and I was pounding into the bed. Actually, I don't want you to have anything to do with me. I just want to split open red and black pussy. Why don't you let me go? I want to go back to that non-existing where I can do what I want. When I like you a lot. That doesn't work. If I let you make all the decisions, you'll be my father. I don't want to make any decisions. People tell me what to do very easily, and I won't stand being told what to do, so I avoid people. He's never going to give me what I want, but I'll still fuck him. Okay, baby, jump. What's the matter with you? Are you too fat to jump? I've got five minutes. You're going to be a creep and not do anything. I'm scared, too. I want it. Flesh is it. Your lips are it. Isn't that the guy in the corner waiting for you? That's why we've only got five minutes. Now, part two, at the door's edge. During the night, these streets, very narrow, dirty, uneven rocks, no way to be sure of your footing, much less direction. As for safety, all sorts of criminals, or rather people who have to survive, hiding under one level of stone or behind an arcade you can't even see, just standing there. No way to tell the difference between alive and dead. Criminalities, which are understandable, mixed with religious practices. For people have to do anything to satisfy that which can no longer be satisfied. We shall define sexuality as all that which can't be satisfied. Simultaneous contrasts, extravagances, incoherences, half-formed misshapen thoughts, lousy spellings, elegance and completely filthy sex fit together expectations which can't be satiated just why are you fucking me you've got a girlfriend named trick and you love her according to you she's satisfied with you and you with her i'm sick of being nice to you so what if you want a girl who will consider her you her top priority and yet will never ask you for anything i can't be her don't fuck me because you like my work. Leave me alone. This is the only way I can directly speak to you because you're autistic. Oh, little cunt door. I love you so very, very much. Well, everyone wants to fuck me, so I tell you I'm sick of this life. Who cares if you're another person waiting at my door? You're just another man and you don't mean shit to me. Please, cunt. I'm cold and I'll be the best man for you. I know you're fucking someone else and that's why you won't let me near you. You're cheap, rad, stinking fish who wants anything to do with corpses anyway. And thus I try to drown my morning. This is the door out I want, God damn you. Now I'm dead. I want one, my mother, father, and grandmother are dead. Fuck that. Two, when my mother popped off afterwards, she lay in this highly polished wood coffin in the most expensive funeral house in New York City, where all the society die after they're dead. Fake, everything was real, but there are times real is fake. Flowers, tons of smells, wood halls polished like fingernails. Rabbi or preacher asks me, do you know anything good I can say? You have to say something, say something over your mother's mutilating, mutilating body. 
it being understood that all society people are such pigs that, and I tell him how beautiful she is. No one cries. They're there to stare at me as I make my blind way through the narrow aisle to number how hysterical I am. Did I really love her? The beginning of the funeral, the family lawyer having walked over to me shakes my lapels. Where are the 800 IBM shares? What 800 IBM shares? There are 800 missing IBM IBM shares, and no one knows how your mother died. I thought she might have given them to you. She never gave me a penny. Three, I do everything for sexual love. What a life it's like. I no longer exist because no one loves me. So when I die, I'll die because you'll know that you caused me to die and you'll be responsible. That's what my death will do to you and you'll learn to love. I'm teaching you by killing myself. Four, you're going to have to die too. You'll be like me. You'll be where I now am. Your cock bone will lie in my cunt bone. Five, this is why life shits, because you're going to love me the second I leave you flat. Sexuality comes from repression. In the long run, nothing matters. This is the one sentiment that makes me happy. Please be nice to me. Most men don't like sex. They like being powerful. And when you have good sex, you lose all power. I need sex to stay alive. Part three of act two, inside. Now we're bucking. I don't have any finesse. I'm all over you like a raging blonde leopard. And I want to go more raging. I want to go snarling and poisoning and teasing. Eek, eek, curl around your hind leg. Pee that twig over there. I want your specific piss shuddering out of your cock. I want you to help me. I need help. Take off your clothes, clothes in prison, clothes in prison, legs and mouths and red teeth still shudder too much, taking off our clothes. Why don't you ever once do something that's now allowable? I mean, God damn it. Hit me. Do anything. Do something. So this hideousness, opposition, blood to everyone proud. I want to knock Ken over with the green glass. I want to hire a punk to beat up Pam. I will poison your milk if you don't leave your girlfriend. Sex is public. The streets made themselves for us to walk naked down them. Take out your cock and piss over me. The threshold is here. Commit yourself to not knowing. Legs lie against legs, hairs mixing hairs, and here a finger pad, a space, a hand, a space, hairs mixed with hairs. Go over this threshold with me. Thumb your two fingers, pinch my nipples while your master bears down on me. Red eyes stare down on the top of my eyes. Cock, my eyes are staring at you, pull out of the brown hairs. Red eyes, now you're watching your cock pull out of the strange brown hairs. Thumb, your two fingers pinch my nipples while your master bears down on me. Now you've gone away. Joel, whom I thought hated me, saw me every other day. And Rudy, whom I thought was the worst, that is the meanest of my boyfriends, always called me every other day or let me call him. And I don't know reality. Peter, who lives with another girl 3,000 miles away from me, and he adores her, her, phones me at least once a month. This guy obviously doesn't care about me, but when he looks at me, I know there's a hole in him. He loves me. No, he doesn't. I can't do anything in the world until I know whether he loves me or not. I have to learn whether he loves me or not. You might just as well accept you're in love with him because if you give him up just because he doesn't adore you enough, you'll have nothing. In the other case, there's a 1% chance you'll keep touching his flesh. That goddamn son of a bitch, I hope he goes to hell. I hope he gets poisoned. Wild city dogs to drive their hounds of teeth fangs through his flesh. A 12-year-old syphilitic named Jamie Smith should wrap her cunt around that prick. I hate that prick. Those fingers. I hate black hair. I want his teeth to rip themselves out in total agony. I want his lips to dry up in Grand Canyon gulfs. I want him paralyzed, never to be able to move again and to be conscious of it. Now, Laos, you'll learn. You'll learn what it is not to know. I want you to learn what it is to want like fire, the driest and coldest dry ice, 
The top of your head will burn and the rest of your body will freeze. Shake muscles will cramp as they do when they're not yet used to the bedless floor. At night, you will know agony. You must learn what it is to want. I am a whore who's unable to hold in and repress her emotions. How can such a stinking fish, a cunt who has experienced what it is to be the wish fulfillment of many men, hordes of men, more men than promote the great Caesar, be innocent? Moreover, she's had such a property regulated life. She can't have the life in her to give me the female elegance and beauty that I deserve. My girlfriend, on the other hand, if anyone ever hurts me, is going to have to murder him. For me, when I'm dying from a worn out liver, punctured guts, three punches in the face and a dirty track mark, because I've lived life to the hilt, my girlfriend will commit suicide. As a whore, Cynthia goes from man to man because she's no man's possession. So there's no possibility I'm going to love her. And if I fuck her, it's just because she's an open cunt. Women's libbers are right when they want to get rid of all you whores by locking you up. I've been waiting for you. Oh, hello. I'm busy now. I just wanted to see you. Wait. Please, okay. The street of dogs, two lines of houses lead to Renaissance perspective. These lines are seemingly only surface connected three-story townhouses. A sun and a three-quarter moon hang fakely over one townhouse. Common household objects such as lamps, a part of a table, half of a torn plastic rose, kitchen curtain take up some of the window space. Outside a townhouse, a dog leans over her basket of laundry. Two dogs, one leaning farther out of his window than the other, open their mouths to howl. Their teeth are sharp and white and they have very long red tongues. One dog over her basket of wash gossips with another dog. Two young dogs are mangling each other next to the curb. On each side of the street, the tall, thin windows form a long row. I can't help myself anymore. I'm just a girl. I didn't ask God to be born a girl. If I think realistically, I know I'm an alien existent. I hate everyone in the world, but I can't think. You're just so cute. I have to get you out of my body because you're a disease. I don't want to, and why should I? I want this sweet thing that is you. I'm going to go after you, aching sore. I don't care what your reaction is to me, because why not, darling? You alone, born from my most beautiful care cure for grief, shuts out sincere fate, come here often. Fiction by my will will become the most popular form. Preparatus, your forgiveness, peace, Peter, yours. To redefine the realms of sex, so sex, I'm crawling up the walls for you. I must face facts, I'm not a female. I must face facts, I can't be loved. I must face facts, I need love to live. Hello, walls. How are you doing today? Hello, my watch. Please watch over Preparatus. You are here because I will never get near him again. He is now forbidden territory. Madness makes an alcoholic sober, keeps the most raging beast in an invisibly locked, invisible cage, turns seething masses of smoke, air, calm, white. Takes a junkie off junk as if he's having a pleasant dream. Halts that need fame that's impossible. I am only an obsession. Don't talk to me otherwise. Don't know me. Do you think I exist? Watch out. Madness is a reality, not a perversion. Among the women, free yet timorous, addicted to late hours, darkened rooms, gambling, indolence, sparing of words, all they needed was an illusion. I reveled in the quickness of their half-spoken threats, more like the violent excitement of a teenager who doesn't know what he feels. These exchanges, as if once the slow-thinking male is banished, every message from woman to woman is clear and overwhelming, are few and kind and infallible. The first time I dined in her place, three brown tapers dipped waxen tears in tall candlesticks without dispelling the gloom. A low table from the Orient offered a pell-mell of layer d'oeuvre, strips of raw fish rolled upon glass, wands, foie gras, shrimp, salad seasoned with pepper and cranberry. There was a well-chosen Piper Heidsick brut and very strong Russian, Greek, and Chinese alcohols. 
I didn't believe I'd become friends with this woman who tossed off a drink with the obliviousness with which a person in the depths of opium watches his hand burn. The master is never referred to by the name of woman. We seem to be waiting for some catastrophe to project herself into our midst. But she merely kept sending invisible messengers laden with jades, enamels, lacquers, furs from one marvel to another. Who is the dark origin of all this nonsense? Tell me, Renee, are you happy? Renee blushed, smiled, and then abruptly stiffened. Why, of course, my dear Colette, why would you want me to be unhappy? I didn't say I wanted it, I retorted. I am happy, Renee explained to me, but the sexual ecstasy is so great. I am going to be physically sick. Act two, part four, on the nature of art. If you read every poem in every anthology of Greek poetry, you wouldn't read one poem in which the character of the woman who's loved is described or matters. That's because women are goddamn sluts. They're goddamn sluts because the only thing they've got going for them are their cunts. The worst thing about women is all these emotions. Take the hole I slept with last night. Sure, she moaned hard when I stuck my dick in her, but did she have any idea that I didn't feel? Sure, I'm a macho pig. Why should I pretend I'm something I'm not? I care about art. Everything but art is a second-class existence. Art, you are the black hole of vulnerability. You take everything from me and are not human. You can take me whenever you want me. A human has to care for one thing. I use whatever I can get from women. I maul the need they offer me. I increase their anguish or insecurity and horniness to elephantine proportions. So the ugly is left with the ugly and consciousness of unavoidable anguish is as it is in me. My writing will cure you of your suffering. I teach young girls how to win the love of men who don't love them. I teach boys how to endure the lacerations of long red fingernails stuck in their face flesh and how to watch. You're not a poet and you're not a real man because you write about emotion. Men are people who take care of the world, who care that people get enough to eat, who stop the greedy hawks at least from seizing more power and underhanded control. Artists who are men have to change the world. When they start paying attention to emotions, what are emotions? They're helping the power hawks destroy the social bonds people need to live. Then my writing destroys social bonds, so that's who I am? You're speaking stupidly, pettily, and you're too smart to take this position. Writing is not about egotism. One day, you're going to realize you're not rational, and then, suddenly ignorant, desperate, you'll leave your politics and run to me away from anything public, the art world, a salon resplendent with gilding and illuminations. One has just revealed original talent and with this first portrait of his shows himself the equal of his teacher. A sculptor's chatting with one of those clever satirists who refuse to recognize merit and think they're smarter than anyone else. The people talk about how they earn money or who's becoming famous all for good reason are grasping. Since the only ideas are for sale, none are mentioned. A few women are existing to maintain the surface that heterosexuality is still conceivable. Eyes never see, mouths, faces are talking to away from the art world. You can say I write stories about sex and violence with sex and violence, and therefore my writing isn't worth considering because it uses content, much less lots of content, and all the middle range people or moralists say I'm a disgusting, violent sadist. Well, I tell you this, prickly race who know nothing except how to eat your own hearts with envy, you don't eat cunt. Writing isn't a viable phenomenon anymore. Everything has to be said. 
all these lines aren't my writing. Philetus Demeter far outweighs his long old woman, and of the two, it's his little pieces of shit I applaud. May the crane who delights in the pygmy's blood's flight from Egypt to Thrace be so long, like me in your arms, endless, endless grayness. May the death shots that Mesagateri's directing against a mede be so far. What is here? Desire, violence will never stop. Go die off, you destructive race of the evil eye, or learn to judge poetic appearance by art by art, art is the elaborating of violence. Don't look to me to want to change the world. I'm out of it. But if there hadn't been between you the two, the dark streets, the risks, and the old man you had just abandoned, had there been no danger, would you have hurried so eagerly? Okay, and then here is part five, the last part of act two, conversations with people who aren't there. Just need one more check in with Ellie. Are we still, we're still tech impossible. Okay, okay. The end, as, as the understudy, I proceed to <laughs> the okay. Um, okay, here we go. So this is this last part. Conversations to people who aren't here. I know you've been going through hell because I've been refusing to speak to you. I know the moment I stopped talking to you, you slit your wrist. You did that just because when you were in your teens, you regularly cut your arms and with a razor blade to show yourself you were horror. Then more seriously, you got an ovarian infection because your ovaries have been rejected. You tried, I know you tried, you did avoid me, except when you phoned me 10 times a day, my girlfriend answered the phone and you hung up. Listen, Cynthia, I fucked so many girls. I took them up to this penthouse sauna and swimming pool somebody had lent me. Beautiful girls pass each other on the stairway, limbs disappear in the shadow, and there's nothing else. The more I knew she was fucking every man she'd meet through me, the more I'd do anything for her. Crazed because I knew every move she made was part of her leaving me. Then I stopped. She ran away with her other boyfriend. I want you, Cynthia. If you don't give your total fresh flesh and everything else over to me, slimy bitch, may you drink raw oyster-like blood, you now living on your dead grandmother's capitalistic hoard, may whatever food your lips and smell come near stink of shit-filled guts, human, always, always, you regret everything you seem your, to yourself to be, your thoughts are wild fantasies, wild fantasies eat you whole, Looking everywhere, looking everywhere, looking everywhere, looking everywhere. Each human is so stupid, it's a ravenous wolf. Long red pointed fingernails will separate the cunt lip flesh, then dig into the soft purple and around the protrusion of the nipple right there, another fingernail. This is why you can't run away from me. There's only obsession. Love will turn on the lover and gnaw. Last night I had this dream, Cynthia, you stood over me, the ring I had forgiven you, your finger, the white palm outstretched, you said these following words to me. I didn't mean to tell you your girlfriend was fucking around, but one, you had just told me I wasn't a female because I have a career, and because I'm not a female, no man will love me, that hurt. Two, you set up the terms of the relationship, but I was thinking about you all the time. So you said, stay rational, but I wasn't rational. This was confusing to me. I explained my identity desperation by telling you I had known your girlfriend was two-timing you. That's why I let myself love you. But the second I mentioned the first word, explosion, so I backed off. I just heard gossip. The gossip was old. She wasn't fucking anyone else. I'm wrong to listen to gossip. Let me be hurt. 
Three, I said, preparatus is no more, but my body reacted. I cut a razor blade through my flesh so I could see the flesh hole revealing two thin purple blue gray wires, which frightened and reminded me of my mother's chin three days after she committed suicide. The body gets sick. I'm not a woman who takes shit, but why do I like you so much? I like you so much. You're necessary to the continuing of my existence right now. And I don't understand this at all. I just know it's true. Cynthia walked away from me and I woke up. I don't want you slut because desire is mad and I don't want to be mad. The end of act two. Okay, so there's the first two acts of Acker's text for the birth of poet. Um, I think we, yeah, we've just, we don't, we sadly have, we've lost Ed, Elliot in the process. <laughs> the play continues to, the sort of like, yeah, the technological unconscious of the play continues to make the sort of collaborative nature of its unfolding impossible. Um, but um, thanks both to Sophia and Elliot. I thought maybe as one place, just to start, just, just to, um, um, Sophia this now like puts you on the spot with this, but um, to, um, and Elliot, yeah, if you wanna maybe anything you wanna add to the chat, we can respond to in there. But, um, but just to sort of like immediately reflect the play back to itself a little bit, just like moments that stood out to you as you were reading it, um, like passages from it or elements of it. I was, it's like the, I was seeing one thing I thought was like the pairing of this first act and the second act, like the way that they don't feel connected at all, but then what kinds of connections like sort of resonate across them. And something about like, if this first act is this sort of like nuclear power plant that is a city and is crisis and it's falling apart and it's about the sort of like impossible labor conditions but also power as like an idea as like an energy field or something and energy and then this second there was that line in the second half where the like male figure is saying like I don't men don't like sex because good sex means like not being powerful or like not being in, in control or something or not having power or something like something about like sort of energy power sex um and the little parts of the second act that are like sort of little theories of sexuality and aggression or something like little like lines that are little like sort of theory droplets inside of this narrative totally yeah I loved that part when they said like men, yeah, men don't like sex because men just want power. And like, if you have good sex, you lose your power. I think <laughs> that was it. That's the line. That's the line. Um, yeah. Like mini theory of sexuality. Um, but yeah, I feel like the thing that I was most struck by, which is also maybe just whenever I'm like reading something myself aloud, it becomes like ever harder for me to follow like a plot because I feel like I'm very just in the the like moment of the language but also it feels like anytime anything like coherent is tr trying to like emerge there's this immediate devolvement into this kind of like <laughs> gibberish or like shock sort of shocking language like the number of times they say cunt is just sort of it's like you know, sprinkled in like, like or whatever, <laughs> but it just seems like this sort of return to a, like, pow, <laughs> yeah. you were going somewhere, like we're not back to the cunt or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I feel like, I don't know. I think the, I understand the sort of strange reactions to it at the time. And I think I think also just what I was thinking about a lot, this is like a more general sort of comment, but what I was thinking about while reading it is just how these certain figures who are very sort of sh like shocking and sort of transgressive at the time, like some of them get picked out to be like really celebrated posthumously. And I always just have a funny relationship with Kathy Acker because of that. Like there's such a sort of... um there's such a a sort of like exaltation it feels like of of her as this kind of like gr like gross 
punk, like violent sex figure that it's always, I don't, it's always just fascinating to me when people have that life after death, because it feels so necessarily kind of like defanged in whatever kind of way. Cause like they're dead. So mm. That's what I was thinking about during it is like how she's talking about death and she's dead and, or the author's talking about death. Right. Right. And to think about, yeah, it's like interesting for us to think about what it might be to like refang a defang, a posthumously defanged form, yeah. you know, like what it means to try to like relate to someone's work that like tries to keep the fang sharp in it or something, you know, or like resist that. Oh, sort of, yeah. yeah. And maybe defanged isn't uh isn't even really a fair characterization. It's just a, uh, it, it, yeah. It's I feel like it's something that always just occurs to me. It like it reminds me of. It always makes me think of like David Vonerovich's work or like these kind of you know just these sort of certain like figures that become these kind of archetypical like figures of moments. Yeah. <laughs> totally. totally. I want to um Elliot offered in the chat you know this like. Good thing about the prose, pleasure to work through. Text felt like some kind of giant human stain or smear, like the promise of enlightenment was constantly being slammed back down. It was really yeah. beautiful characterization of it. I thought maybe like one um, question to throw towards you, Sophia and Elliot, um, as a way to sort of wrap up is to think about the sort of the broader like context of this production in 1985. And like, you know, sort of part of what is like interesting for me to return to this text is like, I write a lot about collaboration and group authorship and sort of modes of like making both within the realm of art and politics beyond the individual that are sort of like marked by ambivalence and antagonism and sort of like a realm of the collaborative that's not just the collaboration as like ameliorative or like thinking of collaboration as like a unambivalent good or something. Cause there's like a certain kind of thing that I think like sort of like maybe the PR department of the BAM Next Wave Festival thought is like, yes, we bring all these artists together and then by all, you know, like that is the cool project or something, you know, like that sort of institutional injunction that I think is actually um, happening constantly. Um, and, and so that actually like thinking about sort of more ambivalent modes of inhabiting collaboration is I think really interesting. And like, um, and I think that's part of what Richard Foreman was investigating with this is like by creating this opera where none of the collaborators got to know what each other were doing and they just sort of like did this thing that was this sort of antagonistic mess um and so I think yeah I'm curious in both of your practices like how you approach um approach collaboration as a sort of like ambivalent medium itself like how you sort of like like I think you know, Elliot, I'm thinking about some of your more recent ensemble movement pieces. And Sophia, I'm thinking sort of like how you relate with contracts and and working with institutions and collaborators and audiences. But like, yeah, like what is sort of collaboration as a as a more complicated medium for you? Totally. Yeah. Maybe I can answer to give Elliot some time to write a <laughs> Um, and also I totally agree that the whole piece feels like a, a stain I think that's a beautiful characterization um but yeah I, th I think for me honestly it was funny reading it because I really I felt I I couldn't tell if it was like all if the parts I was reading how many different you know voices it was but there were certain parts that I really um identified with that feel really like I don't know if anti-collaboration is the right word, but that feel very like singular and like this focus on obsession and this like desire for someone else to be like obsessed with you basically <laughs> um, and focus kind of all their like desire on you. And I think that um, I do, I mean, I love your work around collaboration and, and group work, group works <laughs> because um I think it's such, I think it actually is like such a fraught medium. And I feel like, yeah, it often kind of can start out in this like fun, like, oh, like what if we just brought all these people together or like, oh, you know, I'll work on this thing with this person. And I think um, for me recently in my practice, I've become really sort of like anti-collaboration and I feel like 
I, I think a huge thing that generates a lot of my, my work and my practice is like developing these very, um, intensified and like often contractual or complicated, um, like, you know, one-on-one or two-on-one sort of dynamics. And, but then I think with actually producing writing or artwork, I have a very like tyrannical vision that I want to follow and that I don't want to be disrupted. And I think a lot of that really comes out of just kind of like a childish desire for like you know, attention and soul focus to be on you, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, I'm personally really interested in that as an art practice, because yeah, I think often collaboration can be kind of celebrated in like a bit of an uncomplicated way, or it's like, or just the same, the way that people are, you know, that nowadays it's so sort of in vogue to be like community and whatever. Um, So yeah, I, I think I definitely have a really complicated um relationship to it. And I really admire mm. people that are able to work in groups. I think it's one of the yeah. things to do, honestly. Okay. You, can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Yay! Okay, fab. Oh, wow. It only took this long. Um, yeah, so about, <laughs> about collaboration, I guess um, for me right now, someone who's like working across all these elements of like performance and like live media, and specifically now as like a shiny new MFA holder in choreography of the past year. I think my research around uh, working with people is about like uh, liveness as material. So I mostly find myself inhabiting the space of like a like an architect or someone who's really just trying to build the scaffolding for people's talents um, and skills to like reveal themselves is the logic of my work. Um, so my only real desire at present is just to like make sure that I give the people I work with the tools that allow them to sort of like work within or I guess subvert the logic that I set forth um, as much as they're kind of able to. So I think it's like the the nuance, the mess, the conflict, the the unexpected connections and relations between people is the the fabric and the texture that I'm currently trying to cultivate. And that's like a kind of thing that can't be replicated. Um, which is what makes performance different than like, I don't know, trying to repeat like a color or like to play a song. Of course, there's always nuance to everything, but um, you get like a much richer quality of performance when you make spaces for people to really do the best at what they can do, which in my mind is like why I would only ever want them to join me on stage is like for them to be amazing as well. Great, totally. And also... Yeah, like create conditions for people to push against just as much as to fulfill. Like, I feel like that, like that space of collaboration is really interesting. You know, that sounds wonderful. Yeah, I think that's so, that's so cool to hear. And also, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about the figure of like the choreographer. And so that's, it's cool that you just got an MFA in choreography. Um, but yeah, as that kind of like what you just said, Ethan, the someone who's sort of like creating conditions and is very much quote unquote, like in charge or like executing their vision, but in a necessarily collaborative way. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's really like, I think it's just super uh, interesting and, and beautiful as a kind of that there's just like so many different kinds of like hierarchies involved and that you like you you need the people kind of executing or pushing against what you're offering them to do and they need you just it creating this whole sort of superstructure to like antagonize yeah yeah definitely a superstructure to antagonize but you know i i have to kind of know what i want like i think similar to what you said definitely from like a t- tyrannical place <laughs> for sure but once I know where the line stops with my interests or my desires, it becomes a lot easier to let people push against and within that. Cool. Well, this has been so lovely and fruitful and and weird and, um, you know, like, um, oh, we're also getting, I'm seeing in the chat that we're getting from, from Barry and Bob some accounts of the staging in, in 1985 too, so. Um, oh wow! Check out the check out 
check out the chat hot tip check out the chat um okay uh but no i just yeah thank you so much to sophia and elliot thank you to carolyn and brooklyn rail um thank you all for coming and hanging on a wednesday afternoon thank you ethan thank, thank you. you so much yeah thank you all so much um this is like just a total total pleasure um this has been recorded. So uh, if you didn't catch the full thing, um, we will, that will be up on our website, um, our archive uh, by tomorrow, probably. Um, next Wednesday, come back to our NSE uh, Wednesday series. We have Kor Elia Ahmed curating that one. Um, tomorrow we have a conversation with some folks from Make the Road um, and uh, Reverend Dr. Donna Shaper. Um, that should be great. And yeah, just thank you all so much. We do this thing where we can throw open the mics and everybody can say hi and bye as you leave. And thank you again so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. So awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Hacker lives. Hi. <laughs> <laughs>